Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. If you're new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia, either indoors or outdoors or not at all. So I don't have heat rooms or grow lights or humidifiers or a greenhouse. I am just a humble amateur using the resources to hand. So if that is of any interest, do hit subscribe. I post every week and this week, plant lovers, no, we're not talking about supermarket Phalaenopsis rescue, but we could, but no, I am gonna take you on a tour of all of my growing spaces. Now, a few people have asked for this and here I am doing it. It just takes a little bit of logistical organization and it's, it's a good time of year too. It's midsummer here in Australia. It's also quite a cool, overcast day so it's great for filming outdoors the light isn't so harsh and I actually must apologize for the light because in some spots of the house I have to have the light shining into the camera because otherwise you kind of won't see what I'm referring to in terms of the light so apologies for what's coming up but before we set off on the grand tour I think I should put things in context for you so firstly as I said I'm in Melbourne in Australia now climatically it's important to know Australia doesn't have the same climatic zones as the USA for example because our climate and our conditions are very different here for us it's actually all about rainfall and heat rather than minimums and freezing points etc so we don't really have the same kind of uh, categorization so it's very hard to tell an American audience what Melbourne is like but we will take a pot shop and say it roughly equates to a zone 9, 9B. So it roughly equates to the sort of zone 9-ish area. But in a nutshell, we are described as wet Mediterranean. So we have cool, cold, wet winters that don't freeze here in Melbourne. And we can have hot, dry summers. But the heat isn't for great periods of time on end. So there's often cool breaks in between. So it's quite a temperate climate. It sort of sits in that mid bandwidth and the average humidity in Melbourne is fairly average too. It drops to the sort of the high 40s and goes up to the high 50% mark. So pretty average, obviously in summer, it can be quite dry, hot, etc., etc. But nonetheless, the ambient humidity is quite good. So that's the basics then. So the next question is, where am I living? Now, this house is a rental house because we are actually renovating our new house in a different part of town. And if you're interested in that, I actually do have YouTube videos about the restoration of that house. I will link that below. It's called Hello House Lovers. <laughs> and I don't make those videos anymore. So you get a sense of where I'm going to. Much better environmental light inside the house, I will say. So another caveat then is for me, plants in the house are aesthetic. So it's not really about collecting and having them all sort of in a pristine area with controlled lighting. For me, I like plants and flowers to be part of the whole ambience. So this is one of the reasons I don't use equipment because for me, aesthetically, it doesn't ring my bells. I like plants to be placed in a house so they look beautiful. One of the issues in this house is that we're renting and we're pretty cramped. So Creating beauty is a little tricky, let's just say. But again, in our new house, where things actually sit is gonna be a lot about the overall aesthetic, not just what's good for the plant. So that might be very different for the way that you grow out there. So I think it's good to understand from the very beginning that this is how I grow things, which is more really about the aesthetic look of the whole thing, perhaps more than the exact conditions an orchid might like. Because in those cases, I would have grow lights and humidifiers and etc. etc. But I choose not to go down that path. Now, oh, many long bows in this video, but, ding, but if you're interested in my aesthetic, a couple of my spaces have appeared in publications and magazines. So I will put the links below to places I've lived in the past, which will give you an idea of my aesthetic, I guess, and also in terms of the placement of plants. Now in the previous places, I hadn't quite lit the fire to my orchid obsession, so you might not see many plants, but it'll give you an idea of what I mean about aesthetics to me and interiors and how you work with plants in interiors. Okay, well, I think that's all the housekeeping, except perhaps to say that this house is oriented in direct cardinal points. So this is east, this is north, that is west, and this is south. The unfortunate thing is that the house is kind of aligned east-west. So the northern area, obviously we're in the southern hemisphere, so the north is where the light comes from the northern side of the house is the side. So there's only really one light source in the north, which is pretty tricky when it comes to growing anything really, but we'll get to that when I show you the space. But anyway, 
let's not talk about it. Let's go and have a look. Off to the first space. But hang on. <laughs> this is my first space. So why not start at the very beginning, as Julie Andrews would have said, and this, plant lovers, is the study. So I do a lot of my filming in here. And the orientation of this room is that it is east facing and we get really beautiful morning light in this room. In summer, it's a little stronger and more direct, but in winter, it's gentler, but more penetrating. Anyway, it is a great room for growing things. So in this room, I grow Phalaenopsis and the general light is not high, but there's actually a little sort of box window up here, which is facing onto that onto the landing, which gets northern light. So it does get a bit of a wash of light during the day. So it's not dark, but orchids that like a darker, cooler indoor environment are great in here. And for me, they are Paphiopedilums. So yes, I grow some paths in this room because the ones with the mottled leaves like lower light conditions, it doesn't get too hot in this room in summer and it gets cooler than perhaps other rooms in winter, but not certainly not cold. We don't have any central heating in this house, which is a curse for me because it is freezing in winter. But the benefit of that is that the ambient temperatures in winter are, are quite variable from day to night. We have to use different heating sources. Anyway, the new house will be different and it doesn't have ducted aircon as well. So in summer, it is not glacial. So kind of by accident, it is a good natural environment for growing plants because you have the seasonal change and you have the difference in nighttime minimums from winter to summer. We have evaporative cooling up here. So it is a different type of cooling, not quite as fierce as reverse cycle or other air conditioning type. So it's actually a great environment for plants, not too bad for humans, but it could be a little better. The other thing I'm growing in this room is, oh, heaven help me, Bulbophyllium. And ta-da, exhibit A, this one is Tigridum. And this one is a native largely of Hong Kong, where it is on quite rocky, exposed, sunny outcrops. So I have it on the end of the table and actually gets quite strong early morning light. I missed it most mornings when I remember, but as you can see, it's actually done incredibly well. And it has sent out one, two, three, I think four new growths since I've owned it. It's got new pseudobulbs forming and leaves. They all look very, very healthy. It was quite a large division as you can see when I got it. So I'm pretty hopeful that this one might thrive in this environment anyway. I haven't really had much luck with Bilbofilum, but I feel that this one is a bit tough and forgiving and I might be able to get blooms out of it. Anyway, if I do, of course, you will be the first to know. So this Paphiopedilum is one I've made a video about before, which I will link below. It's bloomed for me its first year. As you can see, this is the new fan, which has taken a whole year to mature. So I'm hoping this winter it will set a flower. So it flowered in this exact spot in this room last time. This is the fan that flowered the previous, so not last winter, the winter before. As I said, it took a whole year to grow. They are slow growers, so I'm just wondering perhaps if this skips a year to mature, then flowers, new fan takes a year to mature, yada, yada, yada. Anyway. It is as healthy as all get out. Look at the beautiful mottling on the leaves. And this sits quite happily on that shelf. So it is opposite the east facing window. Okay, we have covered all of those. So let's now begin the tour proper with our first space. So leaving the study then, our first pit stop is understandably the landing. This space then has turned out to be incredibly useful for me for growing orchids. So we have the huge north facing picture window. And the great thing about it is it's glazed with bubble glass. So it is a filter. It's almost like having a net curtain. So although you can get very strong light in winter when the sun is lower, it's still not direct rays. So in winter, because the sun's lower, we get much more light penetration deeper into the house. And then in summer, the sun is higher, we get this beautiful ambient wash. So it's an amazing north facing space. The problem is it's really the only space in the house with a north facing window. Obviously I'm in the Southern hemisphere. So north is the Northern hemispheres south, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But you know what I mean? We all understand our geography. So opposite this window, I have this beautiful um, Chinese 19th century writing table. And on top of that, I have orchids that basically need to spend all year indoors. 
temperature wise is really interesting it's at the top of the stairs obviously warm air rises so this area is always warmer and one of the warmest in the house because of that north facing light so in winter it's sensational because the average minimum is always reasonably high so all of those things that are described as intermediate to warm that you can grow indoors live in this spot and species wise i grow all of my miltonias live here all year because i can control the humidity why you ask because sitting by the table is a spray gun so every time i walk past i give everything a lovely spritz so that's a good idea to have a spray gun next to your orchids so whenever you're passing you can miss them this area is also the nursery so i deflasked some orchids last year which i made a video about which i'll link below and they are all growing very happily under there there are doritos i want to say doritos that sounds like a corn chip hang on <laughs> not doritos doritis doritis puchella pucelliana there we go anyway that's what it is so i deflask these these are all actually the runts in one pot but all the others are still doing very well and growing and sending out roots and sending out new leaves so that is a little shadier but because it's still opposite the north window it still gets a lot of ambient light better in winter less so in summer but it's great for seedlings or small plants that are a little delicate that you just can't perhaps put in their final resting place as it were because they need the little protection so again a useful spot the aesthetics of having pots on the floor in trays like that doesn't really fill me with joy but until I'm able to better manage our environment in the new house it has to do so for the time being it is perfect so if that's the main spot on the landing, this is the other spot. So this is on the easterly side. So I've still got the northern light coming through here. Again, in summer, there is more light from the afternoon sun. And in winter, it is much brighter here. So in fact, this little area is a great place for growing anything really that needs maybe not as much light as those plants over on that side, but it's still a great spot for growing things. This very fabulous Oncidium, which I made a video about, which I will link below. So Oncidiums, Miltoniopsis, smaller orchids that are just needing to be sort of nurtured in the world a bit more, live on this spot here. The other thing that I've got on the floor down here is this. So this is Coelia, is that how you say it? Heavens, I'm so bad at pronunciation. Bella, Coelia bella. So this is a species that blooms in late summer to autumn. So I'm actually wondering if any of these new growths might actually have a flower spike coming out of it. Anyway, there's lots of new growths and there's interesting little spikes coming up. This is the first season I've had it, so I'm not sure quite what's gonna happen. But actually, this likes warmth, but in direct light so this spot on the floor is actually perfect and i guess that's one of the things you have to do is walk around your house and try and find the perfect orchid and its perfect spot so it can be a bit of a challenge but every house has such a variety of sort of micro climate moments you can generally find a spot for most things all right so the next staircase pit stop is here which is the landing and in fact i often make videos here in winter or oh, I did until I bought my halo lamp to make me look fabulous. But in this little corner here, we get amazing winter light. So this spot, halfway up the stairs, as Kermit may have said, does get amazing light. So once again, we have got the large picture northern window and this area. So in winter, when the sun is low, you get quite amazing light penetration for most of the day until the sun moves across. Then in summer, it's less direct, but more ambient all the time. And literally this corner is warmer than the opposite corner because the sun seems to be focused on it more. So this, ladies and gentlemen, plant lovers, is where I winter things that need bright sun. So this is a Cattleya. Oh, I despair of Cattleyas, I really do. Never mind. This one I've had forever as a seedling. I mean, look at the size of it. I did include it in my New Year's video about things I was looking forward to because I thought it had a, um, a flower sheath, which has actually just withered. So I don't know. I'm on the brink of just throwing this baby out <laughs> with the bath water. But anyway, I shouldn't say that. I'm not. I'm going to keep it here. But the other thing that I keep here is a Vanda that I'm doing an experiment on to see if I can grow them in pots in Melbourne and halve its time so in the winter 
it sits here and it gets really beautiful, strong, indirect light all winter. Then in summer, I move it outside and hang it up, which you'll see later on, where it gets similar conditions, but outdoors. So much more air movement. It can get obviously higher temperatures, stronger light. It's a slightly more tropical vibe for the Vanda, which is actually doing well. Anyway, so this is our halfway pit stop on the staircase. It's a really useful spot. The next staircase pit stop is this area down here. Now, Okie dokie. So as you can see, a beautiful filtered light comes through that window. And when I actually first viewed the house, you come into the hallway and it was bathed in this glorious light. So this side of the house is facing due north which is kind of good, kind of bad, because it's the side of the house, and really this window is the only north-facing window. So in terms of getting a wash of light all year, this is it. So basically every other room in the house, I can't use for growing orchids. Now in summer, the sun is high, so you don't get any direct rays coming through that glass, even though it is sort of bubble opaque glass. So in summer is a beautiful wash of filtered light, the perfect orchid growing conditions, but I have perfect conditions outdoors. So I like to try and keep this area not too cluttered. So what I generally grow here all year are Phalaenopsis. Then in winter, the light is much lower. So we do get sun rays penetrating the glass directly. So this area is actually quite warm and sunny in winter, which is again, perfect orchid conditions. So there's two different seasonalities, the high filtered light in summer, the low direct stronger beautiful light in winter. This area is always several degrees cooler than other parts of the house, even though it has all this beautiful wash of light. But in winter, during the day, when we have this beautiful sunlight coming through here, this little area and just this area is quite not hot, but it's, it's warm, it's a beautiful condition. So this is a great spot for overwintering orchids, which I do a lot. So in winter, the table is packed with Oncidiums, with Miltoniopsis, with anything else that needs to come indoors from outdoors. As I said before though, aesthetics do play a part for me, a strong part. So I really don't like the fact that in winter, this table is crammed to the gunnels with orchids. And I've got bamboo plinths that they all stand on to alternate the heights, but it's not that attractive. And when you come through the front door, it's the first thing you see. So if we had more north facing light and more rooms with north facing windows, they wouldn't all have to be here. So in our new house, we are oriented to the north so that all the main living areas have beautiful washes of light and other parts of the house to have pretty continual light. So it's gonna be a much easier indoor environment in our new house with more versatility. So I'm not gonna to have to mass everything in one spot, which doesn't look that good. Okay, let's go on to our last indoor pit stop. And so the dining room, the dining room table, this window is due south, that is due north, east, west. So the north facing aspect gets almost no light. Anyway, this is quite a huge window south facing. In summer, there's much more diffused light, obviously, because the sun sets further across, so we get quite beautiful afternoon lights. Other than that, not a lot of light in this room. So this is the spot where I bring orchids that are in bloom such as this Phalaenopsis, which was in a video of mine that I made before Christmas, still going strong, and this Miltasia. I'll show you closely, look at that. Isn't that fantastic? Now I just bought this and I'm not making a video about it, even though I'm telling you about it. It is Miltasia Estralita Sweet Senorita. I don't know if you can read that. But the point of this spot is that this is where I do put everything that's in bloom, whether it's a Cymbidium or a Phalaenopsis, an Oncidium, Miltoniopsis, whatever it might be. There's enough ambient light for the orchid to survive the four to six weeks, fingers crossed that the flowers are going to bloom. And this is kind of where we transact most of our business and it's in the living area. So it's a place where you see the orchids most. It gets fine humidity, the kitchen is just here, there's enough light and there's enough warmth. So it's not a bad spot to show off your orchids and enjoy them when they're in bloom. Okay, well let's leave these northern lights and let's go outside and look at the first of my outdoor spaces. Welcome to the carport. Now out here, we are undercover from the carport, obviously. And along here, you can see that I grow cymbidiums. And I'm also just trying a zycopedalum to see if it's gonna work in the same conditions. In Australia, they say cymbidiums and zygos are good companion plants. So they kind of like the same conditions here in Melbourne. Let's see on that front. 
But then in terms of orientation, this is directly due north. I have the overhang of the roof here, which protects all the plants from rain. They get the odd splash if it's a particularly fierce rain coming this way. But we have these silver birches, as you can see, which are deciduous. So this gives me brilliant light. In summer, as you can see, it is dappled in direct light, perfect for orchids. And in winter, obviously, the leaves are shed and then we get the lower direct winter sun. So the plants under here get more stronger winter light, which again, perfect for orchids. Lots of air movement. The only negative is outdoor pests, so snails and slugs particularly. Um, but they don't seem to like the orchids. They seem to like other things that are growing here. And the only other issue is possums. So possums use these birch trunks as highways and run down and often knock things over. So I have come out of the morning and found pots upside down. The way I've counted that is to pack it with pots so that any possum in their right mind looking at it will go, I'm not going to run down that. And this cymbidium, which lives out here all year, is the one that I actually made a video about, which I will link below. This is that cascading, very sort of pale, lemony cymbidium which again loves it out here and in the earlier video I showed you the new growths appearing and as you can see they have all matured very well out here so hopefully next season I'll get um, more than two spikes which would be very exciting. This is the zygopetalum I'm having a go at out here. It's a reasonably large division when I got it with this pseudobulb. This is the new growth that has appeared very healthily. The older leaves are a bit, a bit browned and speckled from its previous incarnation. And what I can just notice coming out here, which you might be able to see, is a new growth. So this psychopetalum seems quite happy living out here with its cymbidium friends. I'm also using this area as a cymbidium nursery. So mostly their species or sort of more unusual colors. And this one is in fact cymbidium vida harlequin. I'll put the name below. Can't remember what the flower is sure it's gorgeous and as you can see it is produced its first new growth which is wonderful so this is a year old seedling I would imagine um, and then each year it should produce at least one, or hopefully two new growths from each pseudobulb so this will probably flower if I'm lucky in another two years so patience is everything with cymbidium seedlings but this is the perfect spot and then the other type that I've got right at the end, which I'll show you, is my Dendrobium speciosum, which I made a video about, which I'll link below. And as you can see, it is there on the end, and it gets really beautiful a dappled light, and then it gets quite strong um, afternoon light, which is not great here because that is due west, and we get very, very harsh afternoon sun here in Melbourne. But those are tough orchids, so it's kind of the best spot for me at the moment to try and give it the conditions it needs. And as you can see, I have got, I think, three new growths. So I am so excited. So that seems to be happy there, and I'm gonna leave it there all year. It should get enough sun in winter to promote its blooming. So we'll see. Anyway, so this is outdoor area number one. This okay, let's leave the perfect growing environment of the carport and go out to my other space, which has most of my orchids. But actually a quick segue because perhaps the most important spot in any orchid grower's house is the front doorstep because this is where everything gets delivered and for me i have got my little sort of succulent enclosure where most parcels are dropped but this is direct west so i get fierce afternoon sun i know it might seem silly but it's a consideration when you're getting things delivered that they aren't going to be sitting in very hot spots I'm very fortunate that that outdoor space is actually perfect for orchids. They are protected from the harsh elements from rain. They get great dappled sunlight in both winter and summer, and they are subject to the varigrees of the outdoor temperatures, but they're still a little protected. Okay, now this space is similar and I'm very fortunate. Some of the basics out here. Firstly, as you can see, a polycarbonate roof, which obviously protects everything from the rain. It is not particularly shady though, so it is slightly opaque, but it is still quite bright sunlight. So I do have to be careful out here that some things do not get burnt. So this area over here gets low, quite good light in winter. And then in summer, it gets quite high light as well. So it actually seasonally is a fantastic place for orchids. 
The only thing in summer is that it can be quite fierce because as I mentioned, the opacity of the polycarbonate isn't particularly shady. So still quite a lot of strong light gets in, but that's great for some orchids that need strong light. The only other thing though, is that it can act like a bit of a greenhouse. So it can get really hot. And in summer in Melbourne, we can get fairly hot periods. And in fact, we've just gone through one and I've really had to keep my eye on things that are over there. The great thing is though, I've been able to utilize this lattice work across the top to hang some dendrobiums. And then over here, there are all sorts of cattleyas, lilias, dendrobiums, other misc things that, that are liking quite strong light. And with the layers of this shelving, I'm able to create some shadier spots underneath and some brighter levels on the top. So this is a very useful spot. And here too, I'm also experimenting with putting things in hanging baskets. I'm just not sure how I can move the hanging baskets to the new space, but here it's perfect because they are protected from rain. You can control the moisture and these are actually quite dappled sunlight conditions. So this area is a bit shadier than just over there. And over here, I'm trying Stanhopias. And this one's actually a gift from a lovely follower that I was randomly buying another orchid from. And I have another Stanhopia over there and I'm also giving a go to Sologenes in Hanging Basket. So all of these are works in progress, so we'll see what happens with those, but again, perfect conditions for them. So that's the sunny area I was just describing, and here is a sort of a shadier corner. In winter, this area gets quite beautiful, very early morning light, and then not bad dappled light in winter, but in summer, the sun is higher, and this corner is a lot shadier and cooler. So along here, I have a lot of oncidiums that are summering outside, and uh, Miltoniopsis, and at the end there is Kelly Spangled Banner, is putting on a semi-summer flush of a couple of blooms and a flower spike, which is quite beautiful, but it should really be bursting forth with a proper flush in autumn. Who's going to quibble? This fabulous creeper is accidentally creating a lot of beautiful shade for the Stanhopias, which I have learnt plant lovers do not like strong light. The leaves, which you can't really see because it's lost in the jungle, get really quite burnt. But anyway, when hopefully one of my Stanhopias blooms, I'll do a video on that and talk all about my learnings, but thus far they're doing well. And summering out here too is this Vanda, which is one of my experiments. And I actually made a video about plants I'm experimenting with, which I'll link below. And I just found these macrame hangers in our local hardware store and <laughs> they're a bit 70s chic, but really great for the Vanda. So this one summers in this spot. And again, weirdly in summer, this is sort of an area of really bright light. Obviously with the polycarbonate, it's not direct. It is a little filtered and this Vanda is just loving it. As you can see, it's got amazing growth. And then in winter, it sits on that brass table on the landing, which I showed you before. And that gets amazing winter strong light. So with my Vanda experimentation of growing them in pots in Melbourne, this one seems to be doing quite well. It was a tiny seedling when I bought it and it's probably grown maybe four leaves. So it's really getting quite big. And this is the newest summer leaf, which is just growing. There isn't another sign of a leaf, but never mind. That's quite happy and so am I. The great tragedy and monumental waste of space in this space is, ladies and gentlemen, exhibit A, the jacuzzi. Shall we take a seat? So let's look at some basics of this space. Firstly, as I mentioned, it is all covered with polycarbonate, um, which is actually a really great material because it obviously allows a lot of light through and it is gently filtered, but not very filtered. So in Australia, you'd need really shade over the top of that if this was gonna be a full-time orchid house, unless a part of it you wanted to grow things that want really strong sun, so vandas and cattleyas. Otherwise, if this were mine, I'd probably have to cover it just to dampen down the, the level of light in summer particularly. The negative is though that it can get quite hot because we can have hot summers. So on a hot day in here, the ambient temperature is much greater than just on the other side where the roof isn't. Here is due north, so we get amazing light but there is a row of three evergreen magnolias, the grandiflora type called Little Gem. They are evergreen, which means that they filter the light perhaps a little too much in summer, so it can be quite shady. And then in winter, of course, they block out most of the light because the sun is lower. So it's not ideal, and it's a miracle that I can grow anything out there really at all. 
So behind me is due east. In winter, the sun is much lower, so I get more penetration into the body of this space, but for a briefer amount of time. And then in summer, we certainly get more penetration for a longer period of time in different spots. And obviously the sun is higher, so the wash of light in summer is much greater over the whole space than in winter which means a lot of moving around to try and get things in their optimum position sort of month by month as the sun moves. Some things are out here all year and that involves then moving them around to maximize their light and then other things go indoors when the temperatures start to drop below 10 degrees which is about 55 Fahrenheit at night and then that entails a whole reorganization again bit labor intensive plant lovers and I'm looking forward to being able to manage that a little better in our new place where I can really understand the environments more and control them more because it will be mine. So in many regards, by accident, I have a really good outdoor space apart from the unspeakable jacuzzi. Here in the middle is actually, it's a beautiful Chinese 18th century red lacquer table. In summer, this area is very bright. And in winter, this area gets a lot of beautiful early morning filtered light. So for orchids that I'm growing outdoors all year, this is the place where I tend to gather them most in winter and sort of maximize their light. And then in summer, orchids that are summering outdoors from indoors, I put in this spot because it again gets really great light it can get quite hot but only for the first half of the day then the sun tends to move over sort of mid-afternoon and then we get more shade here but this is a great spot and at the moment i've got a lot of sarcochylus and i've got a lot of oncidium alliance and a lot of dendrobiums and that's kind of the mix on this table all the catacetum types so the ones that have these pseudobulbs and all this amazing growth in summer which then dies down and then the bulb fattens and flowers blah 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 all of those summer out here because they like quite bright light not direct sun because the leaves are quite fragile but they are all out here enjoying the weather lots of oncidium types this is a, a young plant which hasn't flowered for me yet which is a wilsonara soul fire all of those intergeneric hybrids live out here either just in summer or all year. So Miltasia, for example, lives out here all year. Some species on Cidium and Odontoglossum that are cold, cool growers, I keep out here all year. My Sarcochylus, obviously, are out here all year. Now, if I had the space, they would actually be sort of more out um, under the elements, but protected by a tree, but I don't. So what I need to give these is maximum light. So at the moment, they're sitting on the table in the middle. So all the Sarcochylus are out here. You might remember Cecilia, which is over here, which is doing very happily. I made a video about that, which I'll link below. Obviously, Mazdavalia are out here. This is a new division for me, which is called Falcata Gold Digger. Um, there we go. So Mazda Valley, as we all know, cool, cold growers. Um, I give mine quite strong morning light out here. It does get quite hot under here, and I'm surprised that the Mazda Valleys don't show any sign of heat stress. But fingers crossed so far, it does cool down quite quickly, so they seem to cope, and we don't have that many days on end where it gets really hot out here. And then the sort of random things I'm just trying. This is an encyclia, sort of bigger than a seedling, but it's um, a small plant, lots and lots of new growth. So I've been trying this one outdoors all year. So we'll see how I go with that. Another thing I'm experimenting with here is a Bifrenaria. This had a really big root system, which is why it's in such a wide pot. And it's produced two new growths for me. Um, it's a division, these old pseudobulbs here. This can take outdoor temperatures all year. So it's living outdoors all year. And that is big enough to flower, I think. So watch this space. If I have any luck with that, I will be telling you. Sologenies are out here, obviously. I've got one hanging up, which you can see just over there, which didn't flower for me last year. I thought it was going to, but the spikes just aborted. I'm not quite sure what happened there. It might not have been getting enough water at that particular point, but the other selogeny that bloomed for me, which I made a video about, is over there too in the shady spot. So selogeny seem to like it. I'm experimenting with them in baskets. So species-wise, it's a pretty mixed bag, but anything that is outdoors all year is in this area. And so out here, this is the garden, which is really tiny, but it's jam packed. I am growing a lot of these things for the other garden spaces in our new house. So this area is exposed to the elements. It's not protected, so things get rained on. But out here are terrestrial things. So pleonies and the Japanese and Chinese ground orchids I have out here. 
in the elements. They are under other plants, so they get sort of dappled rain protection, but essentially they're out in the elements. And a lot of my Australian dendrobiums are out here. Again, the problem with this space is the winter light, and they are really not able to get their maximum fix of winter light, which promotes flowers. So they are probably the, the group I struggle most with in this house is that I really can't give, in fact, any dendrobium really, uh, maximum winter light. So there's only one or two spaces where I can put them in winter. Some of the specimens are so massive, they kind of take it all up. So the little ones have to fall by the wayside, but they're growing vegetatively. So when we move, hopefully I'll be able to give them the perfect spot. So another thing I'm experimenting with out here I can't really do mounted things or hanging things because if they are a species that can't take the cold, I have to move them indoors and I just don't have the, the space indoors to hang things. So out here, I'm only trying to grow things in baskets that can stay outdoors all year so that when we move, they'll be able to stay outdoors. And this was a great thing I actually found on the, I always call it the trolley of death, you know, the areas in a garden center where everything is heavily discounted. This didn't need saving. It's the most fantastic hanging basket and it's actually made from a chunk of tree fern trunk and it's been drilled through so it's got suspension wires and it's slightly hollow so I was able to fill that with a very loose orchid bark mix and I'm trying an Australian dendrobium hybrid called Hilda Poxton which is a really famous hybrid type I'll put the name below and you can google it to have a look at the flowers mine hasn't flowered yet because it's still quite young but it could be big enough to flower next year if it does I will make a video about it so there we are, plant lovers. This is my outdoor growing space. A lot of things are out here all year, but a lot of things also summer out here and winter indoors, as you saw. So it really is quite flexible and quite useful. Like any space, there are sort of downfalls and negative aspects that you've got to overcome, but it's the same in any growing space. And then the other thing is really, I guess, just to learn how it works. And that's particularly about the aspect. So where does the sun come from? How does it change through the seasons? How low does the sun get? What's the wind like? So luckily this is very protected, so we very, very rarely get any wind coming from an easterly direction, which would be straight into this area. So it, it's very protected. Um, there's enough breeze to keep the air moving. It does get a little warm. There's not perhaps enough light in summer it's because of the magnolias, but generally it is a great space and I feel very lucky I've been able to experiment with lots of different things out here. So there you go, outdoor space. Plant lovers, I'm exhausted. I hope you enjoyed the tour of my grow room, really spaces. It's great to be able to show you where I grow things because I should have said this at the beginning, but one of the things when I started to look into growing orchids was really just seeing where they were growing. And it's not that easy to find images of where people are growing things. So I do apologize, it's taken me so long to make this video. But as I said, the season is just right now because the temperature's right, everything's sort of in its summer home some things are blooming, things are kind of looking neat, so it's a good time to show you what I'm up to. I hope it has been of some use. I must stress again, I'm a complete amateur, so finding where things work throughout the house and the outdoor spaces is a constant challenge for me, as I'm sure it is for many growers, particularly if you don't have a dedicated greenhouse or grow room. So it is fun, but it can be a challenge. My other, I guess, only sort of fear and concern is that I don't live alone. And so my other half has to put up with all of this greenery as well. I must say he is very tolerant, but that is one of the reasons why aesthetics do really matter because I need and want the house to look beautiful as well for other people, not just for orchid obsessives. And then I guess the next logical thing is moving. You know, I have spent my life moving house, so I am really not that concerned about it. It's just a job. It's just a project to be engaged with. So I'm not anxious about it. I've moved so many times and I've moved plants so many times. I'm the child of a serviceman, so we used to move constantly throughout my life. So actually, this is really weird. I love it. I love packing and moving and unpacking and all of that malarkey. So yes, it will take some time, but I'm not really phased about that. I'm more phased about creating the spaces in our new house where orchids can thrive because this is our forever home. Uh, I've got to make sure it works for me and my orchidy friends. Anyway, plant lovers, that whole adventure is another story which is probably at least a year away. So we're going to be in this house for at least 12 to 18 months, I imagine, before our new place is finished. But that will be a whole nother journey for us to go on together. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching this somewhat epic grow room adventure. I hope it has been useful. I have always loved watching other people's grow room videos and seeing what they do and where they do it. 
So I hope perhaps the way that I approach it has been of some use or interest to you. Anyway, come what may, I post every week, so hit subscribe and you can see what I'm up to next week. But until then, thank you very much for watching. Take care and I'll see you next week.